Now, as I was just discussing with my colleague Jeff, um, there's enough to talk about to make this lecture last about a week, but we're going to do our best to try and navigate it in um, the next 90 minutes or so. And um, I think really the most natural point to start off in um, this huge area that we have to talk about is really to ask you, Wally, um, what it is that made you first do what you do? Um, hello. Um, everybody feels okay, good? <laughs> Jet lag is passed away, yeah, okay. Um, um, I suppose it's a s seek for visuals, seek for honesty, and um, many things. Um, when I was young, when I was about 14, everybody, uh, anybody who would see me would swear that I was to become a pilot because I was into aviation so much that um, there was no doubt about it, I was to become a pilot. And anything that resembled um, a cockpit was heaven for me. And the first time I entered a recording studio, I saw a cockpit. I saw a place that was nothing, that was just cold equipment, cold gear. And um, you just had to bring your knowledge, your experience of life, what it is that you wanted to do, and where you wanted to go to make it fly. And that's what a recording studio is to me, ever since. Nowadays it's a laptop, but that hasn't changed. It's the same thing. That's what made me do what I do. And, and how, how would you best describe what it is that you do? Um, if you look at my website, you would see the first thing I put was a painter. Um, I think I'm a painter. Actually, I thought I was, but I didn't dare saying it up until Manu Dibango told me, Wally, you're a painter. And I said, oh, yes, thank you. That's exactly where I want to be. <laughs> I'm a painter, but um, I think uh, we are very privileged in making music that um, we design the thing that we want to paint. And painters m normally actually take uh, um, their models from outside of their mind to actually paint something, unless we're talking about abstract painting. Um, and even abstract painting derives more or less from the regular thing that you can actually see. Um, I'm a painter. I'm a soul painter. I paint with music, I paint with notes, I paint with sounds, I paint with melodies. Melodies comes first to me. Mm. I know it sounds a bit strange for somebody who loved James Brown, uh, but I can tell that James Brown is a melody man before being a rhythm, a groove maker. How can you tell that? Well, listen back to what he did in the 50s, 60s, and you, you'll find out that, that he was an incredible melody singer to start with. So melody versus groove, melody wins for you. Yes, um, that's a very hot issue to me, even today. Um, I believe that um, the value of a melody is difficult to appreciate. Um, it, it, it is more than just putting notes together. It is actually creating textures. It is, with just a melody, with just knowing exactly what an instrument can do, you can create things that the best synthesizer in the world won't do. I'm a synthesizer specialist, by the way, I'm sorry to say. Um, but um, the more I learn and the more I get, um, uh, I'm growing into um, um, mastering my, my machines, the more I realize that people like Ravel and Debussy we're capable of doing the exact same thing, in, even better than what we do with synthesizers, just by using the right timber from an oboe and a cello and a flute and a violin. And they do that just by telling each 
of them what exactly to play, what note to play. I believe that also if you listen to, I don't, I don't know who, how many of us here know about Joseph Zavino, weather report. Um, he would pick up any synthesizer, even the cheapest one, plastic sounding Korg machine, and make it sound incredible simply because he would be playing the right notes. You know, and that to me is key. So although you paint with um, a range of different mediums, mm. both as a producer and as a musician, um, your, your, your paintbrush of choice is, is the keys when you... It's the keys, yes. It's the synthesizer. I see in the synthesizer the, the extension of the recording studio medium, which is that you have something that is totally bland, that has nothing. I mean, in when I started with the synthesizer, nowadays synthesizers are loaded with thousands of so sounds, and you can download them by the millions. But when I started out, a synthesizer was just a blank piece of machine with just patch chords, and we had to devise the sound from the ground up. And that was what a recording studio was also. Tape machine was just sitting there, and you had to put something onto it that will make the whole of the world dance to what you did. That's, for me, it's unbelievable. And it still is an un unbelievable experience. I would tell you about what I'm doing nowadays. If you ask me, what do you do today, Wally? I know that we'll come back to that later. I'm a stage actor. Yes. I went into theater five years ago, and I embraced that thing like, wow. And I thought it was that different from music. It's the exact same thing. But we are very privileged that the things that we are expressing come from our inner soul, where a stage actor will imp impersonate somebody that is a character out of a book, out of a novel. Um, why was I going on to that? I can't remember anymore. What you're doing right now. Yes. Um, because um, um, I just wanted to talk about what actually is the beginning of things. What I love about music is that you can actually go anywhere in the world. Do I have a favorite place in the world? No. I can be happy anywhere as long as I have a place where I can start something that is within myself and that will propel, you know, that I will project to the world that will go beyond the four walls of wherever I am. That's basically it, you know. And even though you consider yourself a citizen of the world now and have traveled everywhere, where did it start for you? Where were you born? Well, I'm African from Benin, Yoruba, from a Muslim father, a Catholic mother. I speak French, I speak English, I spent 10 years in Africa, about 10 to 15 years in uh, the Bahamas, speaking English. Spent a lot of time in London, Indian food, uh, and the rest of it in, uh, in America, in France, everywhere. So I belong to the world. Actually, it sounds corny, but it's a reality. Uh, I, one of my main um, motos is that uh, you're not reduced to where you come from. You are also what you've been, how you've been raised, how you grew up, but also each and every experience that you go through is your root, just as much as where you come from. That's my belief. And um, all those ex wonderful experiences, all those wonderful people I've been privileged to work with are my foundation just as much as where I come from. And just to fill people in that haven't got the full spectrum of, of where you've been and where you've worked, can you just give us a few examples of some artists that you've collaborated with over the years? Well, I've been uh, real privileged to work with some of my heroes to start with. Um, yesterday I named a few. Um, the music that you heard that when you came in was from Fela, and I produced a Fela album. Actually, it was a triple album, 
made of, no, double album made of three songs. Um, I worked with James Brown, Godfather of Soul. That was a very short-lived experience, but we'll, t we'll talk about that later. Um, worked with um, Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones. Paul McCartney, we had a jam together in my studio. I just cannot believe uh, even today that I did all those things with those people. Herbie Hancock, um, Joseph Zavino. I'm yet to work with Stevie Wonder. We worked with Quincy Jones on the French Bicentennial. He was our godfather. And, well, that's more or less it, really. <laughs> And um, where, when would you say the bulk of your most well-known music was recorded? It's difficult to say. Actually, they were in the 80s, I would say, m most of what people know about me came from the 80s area. That was basically in Europe or England, a band named Level 42, who I was part of. You, you were the kind of unofficial fifth member, right? Yeah, that's how they put it. And I suppose they're right, um, in the sense that I not only work with them, but we, we co-wrote tunes together. Uh -huh. And um, so that was for the England side of things. Uh, from the West Indies, Bahamian, Island Records side of things, I would be talking about Grace Jones, mainly. Um, Robert Palmer, The Talking Heads, Tom Tom Club, uh, Jimmy Cliff. Um, a bit of Bob Marley with, on a soundtrack that I did uh, that was called Countryman. Um, Gregory Isaacs. Um, I don't have the whole list. I mean, yeah. all that era. Yeah. Um, French artists as well, but if I name those, maybe if I say Serge Gainsbourg, it would mean something to some people here. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, also, um, Manu Dibango, loads of African artists like Salif Keita, Waziz Diop, um, Yusun Dor. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege to work with an Indi an, a fabulous Indian percussion player called Trilok Gurtu. Uh, I went to Bombay to w work with him. Um, I think we're going to go into depth in, uh, into okay. all of those areas as, yes. as, we, as we go on. But you also, as a session player, involved in um, some absolute smash hits, right, of the 80s. I mean, certainly records that were on high rotation in, on the radio when I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, should, we, should we give people a, a little selection of some of them just to see if they uh, Please be my ring guest. any bells? <laughs> okay. You might recognize some of these records. very precious to me because it was the very first thing I ever did with a British band. Up to then I was just a regular French session player and I was to work on a, should I say, should I be honest with everybody here? Yeah. Film Rose, Film de Cul. Yeah, we were doing those little piece of music for, say, you know, uh, sex movies. <laughs> you got to make a living somewhere. And uh, the bass player was uh, English, and the drummer was English. And between sessions, we used to sort of jam a bit, you know, and they say, oh, yeah, Wally, you should meet my brother. He's working on something. I'm sure you're going to love it. And one day, I was just uh, sleeping because I had a very long night um, d demoing on my four-track TAC machine. And I received that call from that guy saying, Wally, you should calm down. It's great. You're going to love it. And I say, oh my god, I'm too tired. Um, but I come. And I brought with me a Korg machine that didn't have any preset. Oh, it only was preset, actually. It was a polyphonic ensemble. and. Uh, there it was. It was pop music. Um, it, it was its um, 15th version of the song. And we spent a whole week devising just a bass sound. 
because in those days synthesizers didn't have neither memory nor MIDI. So by the time we had the sound, it was our friends. Um, he had an album that he wanted to do with for Grace Jones, who happened to be Jamaican also. Um, and his idea was to get some kind of a cocktail of musicians. And he had Sly and Robbie in the pocket already. He did not know me, but he heard of me through pop music and other stuff that I used to do with a band called Gip the Gibson Brothers. We had, there was a tune called Cuba. Somebody remember that one? Yeah, I used to do all sort of things on that. And, uh, and then he said, OK, Wally, I want you on this. And I took the, the, the plane and landed there and met Sly, Robbie. I did not know who those guys were, really. Uh, even Chris Blackwell. I mean, I saw somebody come into the control room uh, barefooted, <laughs> just sitting like relaxed and everything. And uh, OK, there it goes. Oh, you want to do this? OK. I was furious. Why? Because I was a kind of guy who, you know, regular type of session player. You say 9 o'clock in the morning, 5 to 9, I'm there. And my, I'm ready to go. In the Bahamas, we're talking Jamaican style. It's uh, soon come. So I was there for four days, and nothing happened. <laughs> so when the session finally started, I was furious. I, was just, I just wanted to go home. I just had enough of that up until, up until we did private life. Do you have that thing? I have remakes in the dark. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, so it would have been very difficult, publishing-wise, to start starting to share things that were already settled before I ever came in. So, but still, you know, today nobody would do that without having a share, right? You wouldn't do that without having a share, would you? <laughs> um, I've got a dub here as well. I want to play a bit of that. I love that. Please. I used to be called Prophet. <laughs> hey, Prophet! <laughs> ah, look at that. And it was, and it was not, I mean, to me it was just, okay, this is what I have for the time being. I'll come back later and devise something smarter than this. I can't live, you know, I mean, this, you, can, you can't keep this. <laughs> there we go again. You know, um, the good thing about working with people also is that you learn to, you learn from them. You learn from their body language, you learn from the way they react, that you're actually there. The thing that you're looking for is already there. Yeah. You don't have to be too hard on yourself sometimes. And can you tell us about what you learned and, uh, from Sly and Robbie in that period? Well, that very thing, which is that, if it was not cooking, it was not cooking, and there was no point trying to even go any further. Um, Blackwell will come with a bunch of tunes to try, and they will give just a couple tries to each of them. If on the second try, if it was not cooking, forget it. And I was like, I mean, that's it. Look, I mean, we can still do it. We can, we can do it, please. No, no, it's not, it's not happening. Forget it. And they were right. Because, see, when I left Nassau the f very first year, I was so happy to be back to the regular thing. You know, nine in the morning, 5 to 9, I'm on time. And I was doing all those boring sessions. And one day, I just put a, a cassette of the rough mixes of those things. And I listened and realized that this was music. That's what music is all about. It's got to be just there. Sometimes it needs to be worked. Sometimes it just needs just to flow. And this is the very, this is the hardest thing that we musicians have to come up, um, to, um, uh, to terms with. When is it that you actually made it? Do you still need to work harder on what you did, or is it already there? How do you define that? There's some level of self-censorship that we have to go through. Even I, I come with things. 
There's one tune I want you to have listened to, but I'm not even sure that I sh you should listen to it because I don't know if it's already there yet, you know. How do you define that? And that's where being a producer comes in. When is the painting finished kind of thing? Exactly. Talking about Fela, for instance. How can you produce Fela? Nobody can produce Fela. Fela is he's, he's larger than life, okay? But even being larger than life, sometimes it's good to have that other ear who's going to tell you that you've already done it. It's there. Don't go any further. That's all I did. I did not give any direction to Fela. I mean, Fela knows what he's doing, you know? I cannot teach him Afrobeat, you know? Yeah, but you still have to record the 15 horns in the band. Yeah, and the uh, 20 women and... Uh, <laughs> and fight against that kid who's trying to shut the, the SSL computer off right in the middle of the mix. Uh, that was horrendous. Yet, it was very short. I mean, we did the whole double album in three days, from start to finish, mixing included. Well, we didn't have much time to fiddle around anyway. Each song is about 45 minutes long. So the question was, when does it start, actually? We, we just had to be ready to go onto blood light, as they say in Jamaica, red button. And how did you know what was the take and what was the rehearsal in that situation? Well, we just guessed that by the time they rehearsed the fifth or seventh section of the song, they were ready to go. And for us, they didn't even give us a start time. They just said, one, two, and I was, oh, get in. And that was the take. There was no double take. There was no second chance. So um, we've spoken extensively about your work as a, as a session musician mm. um, and as an arranger. But as you've just mentioned, you also did a lot of producing as well. Um, in your mind, what is a producer? Um, as I try to say, it's actually, for me, uh, the man who is an alter ego to the artist and we'll be able to tell him that he's already there. That's basically what a producer is. Actually, it's even more, it's more than that, obviously. To me, in a conventional way, the producer would choose the material with the artist, would choose the studio, the engineers, the musicians, the arranger, all of that. That is producing. That used to be producing in my, in my days and still is to me nowadays. Um, nowadays, people believe that being a producer is to go in a studio with a drum machine and, or a computer and start programming things. I never do that, unless this is part of what the artist wants me to do. Um, being a producer to me is from start to finish discussing the project, what it is that you want to do. Why do you want to do this album? What, what is it that you want to make it different from the rest of the pack. Because everybody is doing so many things nowadays, so what it is that really wants you, you to do what you do. Discuss that in depth before going to the studio. And how do you get the best out of the artist once you're in the actual creative zone in the, in the studio? What, what's the secret? I don't know if there's any. It really depends on the, on the artist, depends on the vibes, depends on the music. It depends on so many different par parameters. There's one guy, um, one artist called um, Kalinos Brown from Brazil. The man wouldn't stop writing. Every day he came with 10 new songs. Wally, you should listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. Please, let's finish what we, ha we have in the works, right? And then we'll go on to something else. No, no, but please, please, listen to this, listen to this. And there was a song called Argila. Is it, and it's one of the best songs in the album because I had to give to him at least a listen to this thing. Please, let's listen, let's do it. And we played it, he played the acoustic guitar and I played the Fender Rhodes um, to double his guitar line, one take, and that was it. That was one take because it was late at night and I was hungry, I was tired, I wanted to go home. And it's one of the best songs of, on the album. And as a producer, how do you react to being produced? Ah, well, I've never been produced. 
Oh, but when, you, when, you, when you're doing session stuff, I mean, oh, it, you know. Well, like an actor, actually. Um, <laughs> you take directions from the producer. But most of the time, I've been very lucky to work only with people who trust me enough that they didn't have to direct me. They wanted me in the studio because they knew that the type of color that I will bring in, the type of melodies, counter melodies, gimmicks, and everything would just fit the work. And one of the great example of this is Gregory Isaac, Night Nurse. One of my all-time favorite albums. Why? Because the album was not even planned to me. I just landed there. And they say, Wally, we want you on board. OK, here's the Prophet 5. OK, I was jet lagged. I was tired. I just wanted to. Again, most of those great things happened when I wanted to, to go home. <laughs> and it was a one night thing for me. All those 15 songs, I don't know how many there were, 15 maybe, done in one night. And I know that they've been cu uh, cutting the tracks like three or four days before. It was real fast real spares, fantastic singing, loads of sp space, beautiful. And still today, I play it as if I was not part of it. I'm really proud of that album. Yeah, if you're not quite sure what Wally's talking about, you'll definitely recognize this in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this again is, a, is such an explicit example because what I did on that one is very simple as well. I mean, this, I only did that stab that you hear, ba -da, ba, which is part of the groove, which is almost part of the melody. By night nurse, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. Now, uh, I, I was not told to do that. Um, this is why I'm, I, I still believe that I'm a melody man, because what I have in mind is what I hear as a melody, and I just bring what it is that just will finish or achieve or complete the, the idea behind the melody. And sometimes you don't even notice it, but it's there to just complete it. And before we move on to your work as a composer and your solo work, we should, we should um, talk a little bit about Level 42 because uh, it's a big part of your life, right? Yes. Well, Level was also, again, one of those things that I didn't plan. It actually derived from the M pop music experience. I met Phil Gold, the drummer, um, when we were rehearsing pop music for the BBC Top of the Pops show. And again, we were just... Um, jamming in between uh, takes and it happened that we loved the same thing which was kind of jazz fusion Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, John McLaughlin, Billy Cobham oriented and he said Wally I want you to meet that fantastic bass player that I'm working with uh, his name is Mark and I'm sure you're going to love what we do <laughs> again. So uh, I met Mark, and there was it. It was jazz fusion, and Mark was doing his thumb thing on the bass, incredible. And, but to me, I didn't take it seriously, because I already went into that type of music uh, in France years before. And I thought I was just happy to fly to London to play with people. That was what made me come back to London. Aviation, <laughs> London. And then gradually they started to sell. And it was like, oh yes, we can sell that. And they could sing, oh my god. Because the day I met Herbie Hancock, I had the chance to meet him, he said, well, you don't know, but um, you guys, you, you're blessed because not only you can play, but you can sing. Oh, yeah. I, t I didn't realize that. That's right. And not only they could sing, but they could also write pop songs. 
Now, I know that a lot of people have been criticizing Level 42 for having left the uh, jazz fusion thing and gone into some more commercial stuff. And I would say, and I would reply that um, for us musicians, um, if you can devise a great melody, don't be afraid to do so. No matter how hard you are going to be criticized for trying to seek commercial success. This is stupid. Just go for what you think is great. And, it, and having a great melody never hurts anybody. And uh, they managed to do that. We managed to write and co-write um, hits together. And please, <laughs> till today, I'm proud of it. And that makes my living. Thank you. Should we hear some? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, can you tell us, for the nerds in the, in the room, what are the synths you're using on that one? Um, Prophet 5. I've been a Prophet 5 man for quite a long time. Yeah, Prophet. Oh, yeah, cool. yeah, please. Uh, yeah, yes. Well, I started out with a Korg machines at first. My main, horses for, my main horse for quite a long time was a Korg 800 DV, dual voices. And then I switched on to the Prophet 5. And then, and then before I could afford it, I was granted enough money in advance, publishing advance, to get a synclavier. Now let me talk about the synclavier. Yeah. The synclavier is a dinosaur today. It's a huge machine, much larger than this speaker, even higher than that. It was not a microcomputer, it was a mini computer in those days. Mainframe computer. It was one of the first machines ever to be able to sample to be able to do some FM synthesis, which now is commonplace, like the DX7 and everything, to do some notation. You could read the music on the screen. To have a computer, to have a hard drive, to have a floppy drive, all those things that are commonplace today were pioneered by either the Synclavier from New England Digital or the Fairlight, which was the equivalent almost. And the Synclavier had that thing that, it, that still makes it one of the best machines even today. The quality of the digital to analog converters, which are much better than the Pro Tools one even today. They are almost like the Apogees, I would say. And even today, you will have Synclavier rooms in Hollywood if you listen to Titanic. You're listening to Synclavier. Um, it was a very expensive machine, of course, because it was a pioneered machine. So it, anything onto it was just mind-bogglingly expensive. $60,000 just to have a four-track machine. In, in what year is that? That was back in 1986 or 87. A lot of money. A lot of money. That's why they went down the well as well. You know, I mean, nowadays, with a laptop, you do just as much. But in those days, being able to compose, play music, not having to rewind, being able to change the sound without having to perform again, that was unbelievable. Unbelievable. I remember days and nights I was just thinking about, I mean, look, I wish I had that when I was doing that album, you know, where I had to redo it all over again because the sound was not, you know, and it was a little out of tune. And yes, that was the days of Synclavier. I still have the Synclavier. It's a wonderful piece of furniture. <laughs> I don't use it anymore. Very beautiful piece of furniture, very expensive. I mean, you're evidently someone that's embraced technology from the, from the onset and, and has been excited by its development. And yes. um, as it's evolved, you know, what's, your, what's your weapon of choice today? You know? Well, I'd be like everybody else in this room, I'm doing most of my work out of uh, 
virtual synthesizers. Right. Um, I think it's uh, unbelievable. I think it's great. I think it doesn't. Uh, uh, I still need my vintage just to feel like, okay, anytime I will indulge into the nubs, hands on nubs fashion, I can still revert to that. But as I go, as I evolve, as I grow up with uh, those machines now, I'm quite happy just dealing with the mouse. And as long as I can still create my own sounds, which is what I really uh, encourage everybody here to do. Of course, we have tons and millions of sounds at reach because we can download easily, we can have tons and we can mock about and we can change this and that. Still, you end up with sounding like most of the rest of the pack. There's nothing like coming from almost from scratch and devising your own sound. It's not just um, self-fulfilling, it's also um, putting you apart. You, you can create something very distinct that way. That's, to me, almost the only way you can do that. And I haven't been proven wrong so far. Um, can I play something out of my machine here? No, I'm not playing yet. Yet uh, it will play just in a second. Okay. I don't hear the big, big, big. Ah, I love that sound. <laughs> Common thing between those two is the sound behind the singers. The first was level 42, obviously, and the second one was a Corsican band called Imovereni. And that sound, I spent nights developing. You cannot maybe realize, but what it's doing, it's doing some, not, it's, not, it's not just kind of organ sound, but it's like, uh, like a pulsating heart. It will be beating between left and right, not just doing a, a vibrato, not just doing a tremolo, but more than that, it would be moving within itself. And if you had cans on your head and on your ears, you would be surrounded by something that will remind you of being in a rock type of situation. And that to me is key because when those guys call me, those Corsican guys call me, they heard the level 42 song and they say, we want this thing, please, Wally, give it to us. And they knew it would work with their song. Yes, that's what I like about being able to craft your mm. own sound. I mean, everyone has their own line in the sand about intellectual copyright and where that starts and, uh, and yes. ends. I mean, in, in your mind, do you really need to create all your own sounds to really feel like you own your own sound library? Yes, and probably because I've been raised that way. Yeah. Yes, um, it's, even today, peop most people assume that I'm very good at sampling. I'm not. People think that because I have a synclavier, I have a huge library of sounds. I do not. I, most of the sounds that you hear me playing are sounds that I created either from scratch or from the very basic sine wave tables. But it's uh, something that I really want to develop and I'm not saying that everybody should be doing that. Maybe you can be happy with just using other people's sound. But I wouldn't feel satisfied if I, if I was doing that because I know I can do it myself. And as a matter of fact, I've been part of developing also sounds for um, 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 companies like Arturia, French-based French um, um, virtual synthesizer makers. And... Um, yeah, I mean, probably people of my generation want to believe that, you know, when you do things, you, you, you can do it from scratch. Why buy sounds from, you know, when you can do it by yourself? Which brings us on to the question of sampling, of yes. course, and, and how you feel about that. Wow. 
that's an issue because I'm, I'm going to make a lot of enemies here, but uh, when sampling um, was invented, we thought that it was an opportunity given to us musicians to explore things that have nev never been done before. And there's been, that has been achieved in some extent. But then, that's not probably what most people have been using sampling for ever since. Ever since, you can tell by listening to what you listen to, most people actually use sampling to actually build upon other people's work. There's nothing wrong with that, after all. I mean, when I work, anything that I do was also inspired by some other, other people's work. If you listen to Chief Inspector, actually what I, all I was trying to do was emulate Lalo Schifrin, Mannix. Remember Mannix? Mixing, um, having the musicians all together and everything. And um, at first, that made me, I felt uneasy about it at first, for quite a long time actually. I thought that this was not, you know. But then I realized that doing that, you can still create something. It's not just building a bond, it can go somewhere else. It can actually, you can actually retrieve things that the original work didn't really pursue. So it could be an entire direction on its own. And as long as the original composer or artist is actually rewarded his own uh, um, regular share and it's, it's been um, um, uh, granted permission to do so, there's no problem. Yes, please. Well, the issue here is that it's kind of a delicate issue. I'm one, you see, if, if, if you listen to Stevie Wonder's Pastime Paradise, and then you listen to, I think it was um, Coolio, um, Gangster Paradise, I would say, okay, what I liked about Pastime Paradise was that it went to all those uh, changes. It's not just a groove. You also have a bridge, and then you also have a verse and all that. That was the beauty of it. Uh, Coolio would say, no, the beauty of the thing is the groove. And we can just do the thing on the groove on its own. It's a different way of, of looking at things. I'm more sensitive to what it was originally than what it ended up being with Coolio. Yet, I understand that there's a, there's a beauty into that as well. And being a fan of, a first uh, hour fan of James Brown, where I can listen to escapism for hours, or tunes like uh, Sex Machine around the clock till six o'clock in the morning, well, I have to come to the fact that even I am quite sensitive to that as well. I mean, you mentioned James Brown and obviously whole generations of people spent their lives extending the breaks in the middle of those songs and that goes for your songs too. Absolutely. Um, I mean, are you aware um, of what a massive influence, you know, a lot of your um, work with that rhythm section of Sly and Robbie had on the hip hop generation? I yeah. mean, I've, I've got a couple of things here courtesy of, um, not that. I, I, I do not relate to this personally, on the, like on a musical level. I would relate to this more in terms of uh, 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 um, of um, reward. I find it like uh, any, anybody who would take any of the work that I've been doing in the, in the past and using it is showing interest to the work that I did and just that is enough for me. It, they don't even have to justify. Years ago I would say, okay, well look, you want to do a remix of my tune? Okay, well can I listen to it? Nowadays, I don't do that anymore. You want to do your version of it? Please be my guest. Do it. Because no matter how I, I, I feel, should I appreciate what you do in terms of music? 
I don't know if I'm, that's the issue. Whatever you do, I know that you're paying tribute to what I did. And that only is enough for me. When Stanley Kubrick took um, Rich, um, uh, Johann Strauss um, um, music for 2001 Space Odyssey, everybody thought that it was a great idea. And even today, it's not only a classical movie, it's not just classical music, but the combination of the two is a classical piece of art. Now, I would love to know what would Johann Strauss think of it. Maybe he would say, well, this guy just did not understand a clue of what my, my music is all about. Right. That's it. Well, we've got a pretty good um, example here of the blurred line between sampling and cover version, <laughs> or sampling and the remix. Um, what I'm about to play comes from um, one of Wally Badaru's solo albums entitled Echoes. And if you're not already familiar with this album, you may well recognize what I'm about to play um, via a different source. This track is entitled Mambo. So when it's sampling on that level, as the, as the artist, how do you feel about that? Great. <laughs> Good. Great. Which, yeah, because, um, well, they took the whole lot, right? Right. But um, it was done on, um, on purpose. This has been discussed before they did it, so there's no, no, no problem with that at all. Actually, I've, I, I believe it's a tribute, and that's how I should look at it. Exactly. And um, on that level, uh, just to, 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 to touch for a moment on some of the more boring business side of things, mm -hmm. Um, for people that are in the process of starting um, their own creations, um, wherever they may end up, be that on labels or through new digital media or whatever, um, are there some basic business pitfalls to watch out for that you may have learnt from by bad experience or good experience or otherwise? Mm. I wish I had some sort of recipes or secrets. I don't really, uh, other than you're out in the bushes. It's a jungle out there, right? Um, depending on who you meet, depending on who you work with, depending on what you bring, depending on your personality, depending on so many parameters, things are going to change. Sometimes you need to be forceful about things. Sometimes you just need to let them go and flow. It's difficult. All you have to do, to me, is keep your eyes open, no matter what. Um, um, it's a really, really crowded world out there. Uh, we are a lot to try to get noticed. And we, want, we think each of us believe that people should pay attention to what we do. Um, maybe the secret is to ex be able to accept that, it, that might not be the case all the time, but it will be the case once. When would that be? How would that be? Who with? You cannot plan, no matter how hard you try. Even today, listening to these things, being, sitting here in front of you guys, is overwhelmingly difficult to understand to me. Um, what did I do? I mean, look, this piece, Mambo, I mean, do you know how it was crafted? Lindrum, you're talking about the Lindrum Hotel? Yeah, Lindrum, that was a drum machine. And I was just fiddling with the machine and trying to work out how to store the programs. And I had that thing, and I had the chief inspector drums, and, and that was it. it. It's as easy as that. And then listening to the st in the studio, we had a ball, the engineer and myself, listening to just the drums. And that's why we, you have that very long drumming introduction to the melody. The melody is still there, but it's like way down the list, yeah. in, I mean, in terms of chronology. And I did not expect that tune to go any further than, well, say, Hollywood people who 
may think that this could be a good soundtrack to a film, and that was it. Then you have massive attack to use it. You know, it's unbelievable. It was not expected, and that's the beauty of it is that when you do not expect su success, th that's where you can really nail it. Um, anything that has been forged towards success, to me, never really worked. I mean, look at it. I worked with um, um, Mick Jagger. Has anybody heard that tune that I did? Can I, can I play it? Well, 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 he was lucky in love. <laughs> and that never did it, really. But I feel privileged that I was part of his first solo effort. I worked with Fella. It was a good album, yet it didn't sell massive. Things that really worked for me were those things that were not prestigious, in quotes. They were simple things, like the level 42 things. I never thought that this would work. Uh, the chief inspector thing, M, pop music, was refused everywhere. I mean, the guy fought hard to, to have a label to really sit. Um, um, Robert Palmer, Addicted to Love, was to, supposed to be a failure up until we had the video. I want to know what love is. <laughs> That was a failure too. I mean, the album was so expensive that the, the record company, I think it was Warner, thought that this album was, was going to go down the well just like Titanic. You know, it was a Titanic album. And it sold millions. So, so what is success to you? Success is just that. It's that unexpected thing. It's that thing that you go with your heart and you do not really... In, you do not plan anything other than just be true to yourself and put what you think is good. That's it. Um, it's a magical moment in time and space where what you do meets what people are ready to listen to. It's a cross section between those two curves and how much you can plan what people are going to be uh, 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 available to and what you actually do, how can you plan those two? There are people called record executive, record, uh, record um, uh, A&R people who are paid to understand those curves. Uh, I wouldn't like their job, not at all. I, I prefer mine, I tell you. No matter how successful or unsuccessful I may be, because believe it or not, I have more failures than successes, even though all those things like show like, oh, what he can do, anything, anything he does just goes beyond, you know. That's not true. Before I get that, there was, there's been a lot and a long string of unsuccesses, uh, unsuccesses or failures. And you, you have to take your part of that. Um, I just want to go back to the film thing for a minute because you just yes. reminded me talking about 2001 and, yes. um, and the soundtrack for that, that you've also scored for films, right? We should definitely mention that. Yes. And, um, and I think for a lot, a lot of composers, that's like uh, that, that, you know, a dream thing to do is to score for a film. How does the how, what's the difference in the discipline of scoring a film and composing a song for a record? Well, it's uh, almost the total opposite. It's a job on its own. And quite honestly, I don't know that I'm successful at it. I believe that I've been lucky to work on films that were successful. I don't know how much that has anything to do with my own scoring although people would say differently. I believe that scoring is actually adding your imagination to somebody else's imagination. And that's the very difficult part of it. It, it means that you actually have to bring something that that person doesn't even express 
up until you actually express it for him. And that's what, what makes it so difficult for film directors to pick up a composer. They've, they are very, very, very uh, uh, sensitive to that. Um, it, music is such a powerful medium. With music, you can destroy a movie as much as you can elevate it. Um, it almost has nothing to do with composing. It really is co-painting with the film director. And it's very hard because the film director has his own idea of what the movie is all about. And it takes um, more than collaborating with another co-composer but it takes to actually go into somebody's visions of things that can be preset way before you actually get into the picture. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, some people are really good at it and I really admire them, okay? I admire John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, all those great composers. There's a fantastic great composer, a French composer, Vladimir Cosma, who I happen to know. And he told me, Wally, you are blessed. You are blessed because you can do things without somebody else's imagination. It's yours that comes first. Mambo. Ever since I believe that if I can score for a movie, that's great. It's a dream because we always sit in a chair and we, we always enjoy the John Williams behind Star Wars, you know. But if you can make music that will make people fly in their imagination, that's even more powerful. So that's it really. Yeah. Can you tell us some of the films you've done music for? Um, I've been privileged to work on Kiss of the Spider Woman that was a movie by Hector Babenko, which granted uh, Oscar for Best Actor to William Hurt. And that year, that was 1985, I was part of those people who can make Oscar-winning movies. Then I was flown first class, and I had limousine, I had five-star hotel all that year, because people just wanted me to be on board their movie, without even knowing the kind of music I did. That's strange. Is it like that, that world? Is it a very hard world to penetrate, you know, to the, the world of music scoring for film and television? I, I think it is. It's like anything else, really. I mean, you have uh, clubs. Yeah. You have, if you have a, a, a good agent, then you can make it. If you don't have a good agent, and if you, know, you haven't been uh, lucky enough to come up with a hit movie, then you stay nowhere. It's like anything, really. Really is. Um, I'm not saying that, I'm, I'm still puzzled by that process of scoring movies. And I still wonder what it is that is required to make a great score. I'm just like you guys. I'm still learning. So let's talk um, about your, your solo albums. Yes. Um, there's three main ones, right? Right. The first album that had those numbers that you know of, like Chief Inspector, Mambo, was really rhythm oriented and had and was going different places which I wanted to explore uh, later. Um, then Chief Inspector had sort of a, a success in England and Mambo and I was afraid to be reduced to just a groove thing and I just wanted to make sure that people understood that I could do something else as well. So I came up with a second album which was more which was a, a more classical oriented and, and uh, I could show also more of my programming sound. Like, can I play something? Just a one section will be, won't be long. Um, and this is um, also on Island Records. Your relationship with Chris Blackwell's Island went on throughout the 80s, right? I that's mean, right. It seems to be quite a fruitful relationship. When was, when, was, um, when was this one released? It was 1988, 1989. So that's 88. Oh, 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 the Echoes album was 1983 or 4. Right. And then 88, and 89 okay. was Words of a Mountain. 
And I had, for instance, this thing that I was crafting. So this album is really made of all those textures of sounds evolving, morphing from one to, to another. And also what I wanted to, um, it was more melodic, melodically based. Again, um, um, also what I, I didn't want to be reduced to that neither. Uh, and then I wanted also to show what it is that makes me uh, an, an African uh, artist as well. So I came up with a third album in 2001, which had something like, um, do I have it here? I don't know, hold on. Endless race. No, I don't have it here. Something in the vein of this. Hey, so, those are the three things that I'm, I'm, I've been basing my work on, which is I could do some hip hop, R&B, jazz, soul. I could do some real um, um, orchestrated work as well. And I could do also some African thing as well. I just didn't want to be reduced to any of those three branches. I just wanted people to understand that that was those three things at the same time. So I guess this brings us on to the, 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 the title of the session, really. Mm -hmm. Where's Wooly? We, because, um, I mean, evidently there was a, an unbelievable body of work throughout the 80s, you know, um, mm. uh, up until 89, and then there's nothing till 2001. That's right. And kind then of missing in action. <laughs> and um, uh, why did you decide to take your, your foot off the gas for a minute? Um, first of all, um, I was quite happy and, 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 and lucky to have gone through the 80s the way I went, which is working with great people and coming up with great projects. Yet, uh, out of the 80s, I felt that I wanted to just concentrate on my own work. And by that time, uh, I was looking uh, for, I was not looking for a direction, but I was accumulating material that I wanted to build upon. And, <laughs> and uh, I was called to produce people. I did quite a lot of Af uh, African artists and, and, and Brazilian and Indian production. They didn't get noticed, but they were there. So. I did not, it didn't feel to me that I was actually uh, taking steps back from the, the scene, but it just, it just didn't happen. Um, I'm still working on my own next project, solo project, and in the meantime, I discovered stage acting five years ago. And I thought that this was, at long last, a way to bring the stage performance together with music. Because as I told you at the beginning, I'm a studio man, basically, when it comes to music. I, I'm a solitary worker. I work just by myself, and I love that. I love to collaborate with people also, but it, it remains a studio confined effort. Um, I didn't do much live work as a musician. I never toured with Level 42, for instance. But I discovered stage acting because somebody made me believe that I could direct a movie one day. And I said, oh my god, if that ever happens, I'd better know what it is to be an actor before I pretend that I can direct an actor. And so I went like from the basics. I took lessons. <laughs> and discovered a new love, which is stage acting, which is unbelievable. So um, that explained also that I, uh, I'm taking longer to complete my next uh, solo musical project. But it will happen. Don't you ever worry. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think at this point, we need to um, say thank you.
Thank you. And um, it's not quite over yet, Wally, because I'm about to um, open the questions up to the floor. And um, please, please don't feel shy about asking questions. I know this is the first lecture, but it's highly likely that anything that you're interested in finding out the answer to, um, the rest of us are as well. So um, is there anyone that would like to elect themselves? Great. OK, there should be a mic on its way to you soonish. Hi, Wally. Um, Hi. Yeah, thanks so much. That was uh, an incredible speech there. Yeah, so um, I'm sure we all really appreciate it. Um, I've just um, I've got a question in particular about uh, about this record here. Yes. Um, hey. Nightclubbing. Yes. This is like uh, probably one of my favourite records ever. It, yeah. it, it's I know it's, it's actually uh, uh, Nina's record, but um, yeah, I've I've got this. Uh, Back at the hotel as well. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rabbiting on here. Now, my, my question is, um, like, with the stuff um, that you did, you know, um, the the pop stuff that we played earlier, you know, it's very much, you know, the uh, Bernard was there, the, the US sort of influence, and then, you know, um, you had the uh, the level 42 was very much, uh, very well to me, very English sort of sound. Um, but this record here, you know, when I first heard it, it was. Um, just a very exotic sort of sound to me, um, and I guess uh, working with Sly and Robbie, the the um, you know that that was a very sort of Jamaican sound, but but on on that record in particular, that the well the outstanding track to me was I've seen that face before, and um, that like was just this exotic, very I guess French sort of sounding uh, record, you know and. Yeah, can you talk to us about that record? Well, that was the point, actually. Uh, when Chris Blackwell uh, had that idea of uh, making me and Barry Reynolds, the guitar player who used to be to work a lot with Mary and Faithful, uh, to join Sly and Robbie, was to actually create that sort of cocktail of influences. It was not going to be a regular reggae session. It was not going to be a regular disco session, neither. And I remember when we flew together, Barry and I, and discovered Sly and Robbie, we were very, we were frightened, because we knew that those guys were Jamaican, and they were going to ask us, can you play reggae? And we would come and say, well, we don't know that we can play reggae, but can you, can you, play, can you read music? <laughs> but anyway, that never happened. Actually, there was a sense of, uh, uneasiness at first, but then the whole thing started to gel from our private life. Then we realized that there was a groove and there was some uh, sophisticated synthetic electronic palettes put on, put, uh, upon the groove, and that's what made it so different. So that was the key. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Good tune, a good tune to illustrate that one. Yes, she please. Needs a, she wants to, she needs a mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask more about like, the actual creation of sounds, because that's something that I'm, uh, I developed from the recording school, was actually um, working with Booker and making sounds, and listening to your stuff was breathtaking. Um, I was wondering, with all the incredible people you've been able to work with, do you ever um, take stuff from the sessions, as far as sampling, you know, it was a touchy issue, but um, take, like, say, you work with an amazing singer or vocalist, like, when you had those strings coming in on that sound, it's like, almost sounded like you couldn't tell if it was a violin or a voice. And um, do you use, from working in these sessions, have you ever taken people's things and worked them into these incredible soundscapes that you're making? Sounds. Most of the time, I would develop the, all those sounds by myself. The, and I'm, I'm glad you're raising that issue because it's, it has always been a, a question on how I would work. <laughs> Developing a sound takes time. It's a time-consuming process. And most of the time, you have the producer, the artist, and everybody sitting here and just getting bored to, to death because it's not very, uh, you know, uh, very spectacular. Uh, it's not entertaining at all. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't. Um, so that's probably where um, 
being familiar with your machine was key first. Secondly, working with people who understood the process was very important. Um, Chris Blackwell, who produced those Grace Jones albums, realized from day one that I needed my space before myspace.com was ever invented. <laughs> <laughs> and he just left me alone. He said, Wally needs his space. That's Wally's part now. Everybody out of the studio. And I was privileged to have all the time I needed to do my own thing. When I worked on The Foreigner, I want to know what love is. I had what we call slave tapes. I had my own studio within the big studio. When they were cutting all the drums and everything, I had my own thing where I could develop my own sounds. So that was key, yes. Um, most of the sounds that I would use, um, even though I, m I might not create them right on the spot, were created by myself, either from other sessions or in my own home as well. So it's a combination of different sources. Some of them I would create from scratch. Something like cut as complicated as like strings or violin. Yes. I found like, you know, some of the best synthesizers today, like the Chester and the hard sound to come up with and your sound so warm. Are you using, um, Layers, layers of different things, but it's also it has a lot to do with the the line that I'm trying to do as well. So the sound will depend a lot on the line itself, um, and the type of layers that I'll be coming up with will be depending on that as well. Um, Ah, uh, how to put it? It's a combination of different things. Sometimes I would just mock about and fiddle with knobs and fiddle with the bank presets that I, I would create. And then things will just pop in and say, we'll say, oh, that's cool. Let's keep it. That's what happened with uh, Addicted to Love things, for instance. But um, uh, most of the time, I would try, I would think of something that I want to do and develop a sound in respect to that thing that I want to do. Yes, please. There are two more of them. Hi. Hi. As someone who's worked both as a composer and a producer, mm -hmm. in terms of making a record, how would you weigh up the importance of composing i.e. the ideas and producing, uh, i.e. how those ideas are realized into a final piece of music? It's the most difficult part, especially if you work by yourself. There's a reason why I think it's very important that no matter how you proceed, that you get people to listen to what you do, at least listen to, if not produce. Producing has a lot to do with listening listening to what is actually happening. Um, I found myself on the verge of losing it if I didn't have somebody to come in and just listen to what I was doing and was just by the body language telling me how far I was to the point that I wanted to make. Producing is very hard. Self-producing is very hard. It's like self-directing. I don't know how Woody Allen does his movies. I mean, it's, it's incredible, right? It's not just a great actor, not just a great movie storyteller, but he's also self-directing, which is unbelievably hard. But I believe that he must have, he too, him too, people who can watch. And by just their body language, he can tell that he's there or not. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I suppose I'm looking for is how you weigh up the importance of composition and oh. final production. Oh, composition is first. Composition is. <sighs> I know it, this is a strange place to say it, but comp composition to me is key. Pro production is important because it will 
make your, the value of the composition reach the world. Yet, if an idea doesn't make it by your production, it may happen with somebody else's production. So, as long as you have the gems in the can, which is the idea first, then you're there. That's how I think of it. I may be wrong. Sometimes I know that I'm wrong on that issue, but I, this is what I want to believe. I feel more comfortable that way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Hello. So, first of all, I should have to say that this is one of my favorite uh, albums ever. This one. So, and actually, I didn't expect to see you here, so this, this record was just in my back, just like that. So, and the first question is uh, Do you actually play the sings in a uh, song I've done it again? Yes. So, it's just one of the most, I mean, one of the genius uh, songs, I think, which is actually undervalued a little bit. Mm -hmm. anymore, but the question is, was it that uh, you first put those uh, seeds and Grace, uh, you know, she, she made her work on um, or it was, you know, just uh, she was hearing, you know, seeds first and then, or oh, what? So how was it? How uh, was the order? The, uh, Grace would cut the tracks with us. Actually, uh, the whole of the album was done very conventionally, which is that she would do, do guide vocals as we were playing. And Chris Blackwell would sit as well in the studio with us. And then parts would be fixed here and there, basses and a guitar. Then I would have my own shot, uh, fine tuning, revising, redoing some of the parts. And then she would do the finished vocals. That's how it usually worked. Sometimes she would do her vocals before I do my little icing things. Uh, take for example that tune called Libertango. I've seen that face before. Uh, that one actually was sung before I, I did most of the synthetic part on it, which allowed me to really be doing those things in between her vocals to highlight them. Pleasure. The way I write is very, very specific. I would proceed almost like Joseph Zavino, which is that I would sit on an acoustic piano and develop ideas on the acoustic piano, record them, and forget about them for years. <laughs> then, in the back of my mind, without even knowing, Ideas will flow out of those ideas to complete them, to make them richer, to develop them. And this is what uh, I'm, I'm very um, uh, grateful that you're asking this question. I believe c composition has a lot to do with just that sparkling little idea at first that was magic even before you knew it. It's a very simple little tiny, little melody, chord change, sound, rhythm, it could last five seconds or half an hour, depending on how great you felt about when you did it. Um, but I know my weaknesses. I know that if I just let it go, I, I will probably kill the thing without even knowing what was the real value. So that's why I never rush any of my production, and that's why it's taking so long, actually. I just leave this thing aged like good wine. You're French, right? Yes. <laughs> I like that. I, let that. I leave it rest like a good wine. And if three years later it still talks to me like it did when I did it, wow, I know I have something. Thank you very much. I have a kind of a bonus question too. Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember some of the titles of the sex scene you just called for? Sorry? 
you remember some titles of, uh, of the, the, the sex films you, you scored for? Oh, uh, no. Actually, I tell you what. I mean, I'm glad you're talking about it. Um, um, we never watched the movies. No, I mean, we were doing those things that were called uh, 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 kilometers mu uh, music, music to uh, music au kilomètre in French, right? Which means that all we, all, all we were required to do was just any music, really, just play music. <laughs> and we just had a long jam. We never watch any of those movies, sorry to say. <laughs> yes, anybody? That person there. Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, virtual version of uh, famous synthesizers? Like what you uh, brought five and mm -hmm. the move, but as a I think they're fantastic. And they're getting better and better and better and better. They lack one thing, physical. <laughs> but again, it's a matter of generation. It's a matter of getting used to whatever you have. People, you wanted to believe that you needed to fill the knobs in order to actually come up with a great sound. It's true to a certain extent. I mean, if you're used to it. But then you can also do it differently. I used to have a synclavier years ago, and the synclavier was what? A big keyboard, one knob, loads of push buttons that you needed to uh, activate in order to go to page number 23 in order to do this shape. I mean, it took forever. It could t take forever. But then you could develop strategies to actually get faster to this or that aspect of things, which is not slower or, or more time consuming than actually using your mouse or your trackpad. So it's a matter of getting used to whatever medium you have. But if you, if you have to um, take the Pepsi challenge on it and yeah. um, with a blindfold, are you really honest that you can't hear a difference between the two? Oh, yes, you can. I'm not saying that you cannot. I'm saying that they're just as good at some... I, I'm not, I don't want to develop a cult about vintage. I keep my vintage gear because I know it. That's all. And I could almost blind uh, program a Prophet 5. I know where the knobs are. And, uh, and, uh, okay, okay, all right. Because I know the Prophet 5. I've been using it for so long. But, um, and there's also a, a, a distinct sound out of it. Um, whether the, the, uh, the emulation of, uh, of the virtual copy of the Prophet 5 matches or does not match the Prophet 5, is no issue to me. It has its own distinct thing as well. And um, I'm sure that one day people are going to look at those virtual synthesizers as being just classic as just the Prophet 5 ever was. I remember when the Prophet 5 came in, people used to laugh at it also, saying, well, it doesn't have the meat that you can have on the CS80 Yamaha. Well, yes, but then on today it's a classic. So what the fuss? Sorry. Excuse my French. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I just had a question about performance because you're using MIDI and whatnot, and I think it's refreshing to see you mm. not getting stuck on uh, the warmth and analog and your vintage gear. I think it's nice that you're set in things and learning with it. Mm. Um, but as far as performance is concerned, do you, um, what do you value in your performance when you're playing? Like, do you ever go and change the little velocity of something that you play if you're doing it with MIDI or um, even change the sounds of something that you've played? Or do you, um, are you really dedicated to getting it right with your fingers and, and the performance of it? It's a combination. Actually, are you talking about live performance? Um, no, I'm talking about like in production, like, Mm -hmm. I'm just a terrible piano player, so I always fix it afterwards. Yes. But um, for you, is that something that you focus more on getting the performance right? Like if it's not right, do you go and play it again, or do you 
like fix it in the computer now that you're using the computer? I do just as much as you do. Now the question is, the, the, re, the, uh, the issue is I can play keyboard <laughs> to a certain extent. I'm glad I can do that. It, uh, it really helps a lot. Yet, I know that at s some stage it would be preferable to keep the magic of a pass that I did and just fiddle with things like the velocity, the filters and everything afterwards. So I do just as much as you do. It's just that it, it all really depends on how, it, it's, it's all a question of how much I spend actually doing the, 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 the main uh, substance. Um, yeah, I can be fast on that. But see, I've seen Herbie Hancock once in the studio doing a pass on a Manu Bango album. Everybody was like, wow, listen to this. One take. He's got it. And the man was not happy. He said, no, no way. You're not going to keep this. I need to redo it. Please, let me do it again. I mean, look, it's just so bad. Let me do it again. He did it 15 times. And at the end of that, the thing was dead. Even him, you know, Herbie Hancock, as big, as great as he is, was capable of destroying his own work. Luckily enough, we kept the first take. Now, we all have to learn, OK? I can still improve my playing just as much as you. Probably, I mean, I don't know, but you know, uh, I do not consider myself the best keyboard player ever. I have things that can work that I know how to do, uh, I, and I can achieve quicker than other people, but I still have to work on it. Yeah. Yes. About the creation of the melody, does it uh, generally come from your voice? And then you work on the scene? Um, nowadays, yes. Uh, for um, um, most of what I did in the past came out of from the keyboard, out of playing and jamming and just practicing. I would spend hours just practicing. No aim at, you know, no, nothing in sight other than just feel good about keeping my fingers <laughs> unrested. And, um, and then an, an idea would pop, up, would pop up, and I would capture that, and that would be it. And then I would develop on it later, as I said later on, um, earlier on. Nowadays, I'm more into developing ideas from within, or from guitar. I can play some guitar as well. And ideas that I, that I get from playing guitar are very, very different from the ideas that I get from the keyboard. Very different. Because the guitar, somehow, I do not master as much as I do keyboards. And also, it's, it's definitely more basic. So uh, melodies. Oh, can I play something? Please. Um, uh, quick, Wally. People are waiting. People are waiting. They're not going to wait any longer. Oh, uh, Kini. There it is. This is a soundtrack. There's no keyboard in it, only strings, guitar, and my voice. Very different. Thank you. Um, you uh, you didn't tell us nearly anything about your working state in, in France, but you made search that dance group. Oh, yes. What kind of work did you do with him and what um, uh, uh, other works did you do in France? In France? And you, also, you also told that um, self-production is, is hard. And is it uh, harder to work with a guy who is a self-producer? Oh, no. OK, there are two questions in your question, OK? Uh, the, yeah, the work that I did with the French people are known to
to the French most of the time because it's in French language. Um, I worked in Los Angeles with a, a, a singer called Alain Chanfort, and uh, Serge Gainsbourg was doing the lyrics. That's how I, we worked together on that project. Um, um, and, and, and working with a self producer. That's a very, very interesting question because that's what I want to do. That I'm, to, today, I'm interested in self productions because I believe that there's nothing more exciting than people who know that what they have to do, they have to do it by themselves first. And then get somebody else in to just balance some of the decision, some of the direction, just make sure that they are in to something. Maybe you feel proud of them if you are working with someone that, that yes. is doing everything by himself. Absolutely. Actually, I, that comes from the fact that I do not believe that as a producer I should be doing the down work, which is programming the drums and all that. That to me is not just producing, this is writing. So if we're talking about collaborating on the writing level, then fine, let's do that. But it's a much longer process. If you're talking about producing, I mean I'm not going to play anything other than just some icing, you want a bit of my personal touch here and there, I would be glad to do that. But I shouldn't be doing the core of your work. That's mm -hmm. your, right. And so it's, it's just because you, you start uh, talking about uh, co-production. Yes. And where's the, the line that... Uh, yeah, the, the line is it's very thin between the two. And actually, I do more co-production in that respect nowadays. So if you have anything that you want to show to me and you want me to be co-producing with you, please. <laughs> I'd be glad to do that. It means to me, as long as you know that sometimes my share of the work can just be, okay, okay, what you did is great. You don't need to do more. Keep it that way. Let's go and release it. If you're ready to take that from me, if you're ready to take that word from me, then we can work together. But if you believe that I have to actually go and analyze and put everything, tear everything apart before we are, you have something out, there's no point calling me. That's how I work with Salif Keita. Salif Keita has a band, fantastic band. Uh, he said, Wally, we want you to come in and have a listen. What do you think? And I said, this is great. Don't touch it. Let's go in the studio. You want, you want to do it? Yes, let's do it. I did virtually nothing else than refrain people from overplaying. That's all I did. That was my production. Thank you. Great. Your 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 studio works. They seem very um, like you you space it out. You play like. A lot of respect for the space. Mm -hmm. Is that a big thing, like in the middle of the tape, or is it like a you know, come back in after the vocals are done? Or? You're talking about the studio work that I. Yeah. Um, if I understand your question, Sorry. yes, is you you're trying to figure it out. Seems like you have a, a great respect for uh, the rhythm section in the space. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's something that I, it's natural to me. I mean, I don't. I'd like to be more precise. When I first started, I was a very busy keyboard player. I would play everything, put clavinets everywhere. I would just fill the tape with just takes, okay? I was a clavinet guy, you know, I used to tinky ting, tinky ting, tinky ting. I wouldn't leave one little thing. In. And, and I realized that I was going the wrong way. I realized it, and what helped me realize that was uh, those guys. Private Life, Sly and Robbie, loads of space. Now, I must say something here to the memory of that guy. His name was Alex Sadkin. He engineered those fantastic albums, Night Clubbing, Warm Leatherette, uh, Joe Cocker, Sheffield Steel, Talking Heads. All those things were 
engineered by that guy. And what that guy did was even before MIDI was invented, which allowed us today to be able to sit back and listen to things that are almost already mixed. This guy, out of the tape machine, was capable of putting almost finished mixes every time, each time. So when I was working, I had almost a finished version already. The drums, the bass sounded magnificent before I even started putting my keyboards when I did private life overdubs. That way, I knew that I didn't have to feel things, you know. We used to do that a long time ago where you wouldn't have the proper rough mix, so you, you did not know where you stood, right? So you would just fill the tape just in case, you know, just in case we need something here, let me put it. That's wrong. I mean, to me, it seems wrong today, right? Nowadays, it's easy to figure that out because it's so easy to have the great sound right out of the box. But in those days, uh, it was... So I made it uh, something very personal that I would always fight for something that would be as sparse as possible. Very, very sober. Yes. Do we, do we have time to play a quick example of that? Yeah. Um. I, we can't finish without playing a bit of this, and I think that's, this is a beautiful example both of, of your point and also um, the talk, talk about engineering and sonics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The sound. Well, the sound was pretty much there when we did it, all the way through, in, in, the, control, in the control room. So it was... It, yeah, I mean, Alex Hadkin, he did it. And was, he changed my life, in a way, because he helped me understand that you didn't need to just crowd things up. If you have it, it's there, and it's large, it's wide, and it helps having all the d dynamic coming through. That's key. Any more? For any more? Okay. Um, I was going to ask, you saying um, you make your own sounds and what have you. Doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, do you have like a catalogue of your own sounds that you have there, or if, on every project do you start from scratch with a sideline or whatever it might be to get the sound that you want to? Go Both ways, actually. I have a catalogue of things, definitely, but I try as much as possible not to use it. It will depend on the emergency. <laughs> that, uh, degree, I mean degree of emergency. If uh, I'm asked to do something quick for um, uh, advertising and stuff, obviously I won't be spending much time developing sound from scratch. But as much as possible I try to avoid that because I, I, avoid, I try to avoid repeating myself. And um, as much as I understand that it is a trademark that I can benefit from, um, it's still you know, I'm always trying to do something new. To me, the challenge, the beauty of the thing is each trip is a new trip. No matter how much times I go through the same channel or what, I wanted to make it different. Yes, sir. Do you always try to maybe leave a signature in there to make sure? No. Okay. Never. Never ever. It comes just naturally. I think. Um, uh, uh, yeah, this a certain type of ego that I'm trying to avoid. Actually, what matters is the beauty of the music, no matter, regardless of who that is for, with it, whether it's for me or for somebody else. Uh, I'm looking for to serve the music first, and inevitably, I will have a trademark being developed down the process. I don't have to fight for it. because there's a certain type of sound that I like. Yes? This is my last question. Sorry, this is so fascinating with that last track, like as far as the depth of the, the mm. reverb and where everything is sitting in the mix, and, and that has a lot to do with the engineer, but as far as reverb is concerned, I mean, that's something that digitally I struggle with constantly with your sounds, um, 
are you recording room sounds that you're adding in as well, or do you use have like a reverb unit that software that you prefer? Because it's definitely probably one of the most criticized well, on, bits inside the computer is the reverb. In those days, we, we, we were not working uh, with software. It was all uh, analog. A, a, the long um, AMT Lexicon 200 or, or 240 or 480. Um, yes, Alex Atkin used, uh, made use of, uh, of, of live room reverb and added uh, uh, outboard gear reverb as well to the thing. It's, it's a matter of ears, it's a matter of balance, it's a matter of how you, know, how you feel about what you have. But you're right. It all also comes from the very uh, uh, fabric of the sound itself prior to adding the reverb. So it has to do with how Sly would hit the snare drum. Oh, yes. And he has a very distinct way of doing it, believe me. Which is not the same as Tony Thompson. I know, you know Tony Thompson, a drummer of uh, Duran Duran, which we have on the power station, would have also his way of doing things. You wouldn't sit in the same room as Tony Thompson. When he hits a snare drum, you be, you better be far, far away, right? It was just massive. Yes. Um, so reverb, like production, depends on what material you have to deal with at first. Are you going to be able to hang around a bit this evening if people have got more things to Oh, uh, yes. Ask? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. great. Definitely. Because um, we're going to have to wrap it up now. But um, I'm sure there's more, much more that people want to come mm. and ask you personally. Mm. Um, I must say at this point, please don't go anywhere because um, Gerd is going to come and talk to you about the RBMA radio. But I must say on behalf of absolutely everyone in the room and myself, thank you so much for making the trip from London. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing thank your you time guys. and your wisdom. Thank you. Mr. Wally.